Welcome to this session and thank you so much to the LCCSA for hosting this with us. Today's session is all about EncroChat and some of the other platforms that are similar and hopefully it'll be a really helpful discussion. I'm Alexandra Wilson and I'm um, a criminal and family barrister at Five St Andrews Hill. I'm also joined by my colleague Oliver Kirk who will now introduce himself. Good afternoon, one and all. Um, Oliver Kirk. I'm also a barrister at Five St Andrews Hill, but I don't do family work. I do crime. Um, I used to be a solicitor. I did that for 20 odd years and uh, last year took the plunge and uh, transferred to the bar, having spent about 10 years as an HCA. So that's who I am. And we are joined by... Hi, I'm Greg Robinson. Um, I'm a cell site expert at Footprint Investigations. Um, I've been doing uh, cell site for 15 years in total um, for various companies, but 10 years ago I and a colleague set up Footprint Investigations and all we do is cell site analysis and uh, over recent years I have had some experience of working in uh, cases involving uh, what we we're going to be talking about this afternoon, uh, the, the encrypted devices, EncroChat and uh, Obviously, Alex is going to introduce the subject to you from a legal perspective, and I'll come back to you with some of the technicalities uh, of these devices later on. Thank you so much, Greg. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, our, another of our colleagues, Tess, is helpfully helping us with the slides. So um, if I say next one, Tess, that's who I'm referring to. Um, so starting off, what is EncroChat? EncroChat, as I'm sure many of you do know, is an application. Um, there are some other similar applications, which Greg will go into more detail about later. EncroChat's main USP was that it guaranteed, was said to guarantee, anonymity for all of its users. Um, a lot of the devices that EncroChat was used on would have their microphone removed, their cameras removed, so that people would communicate through this you know encrypted application only a lot of these devices kind of have a dual operating system so that they may appear to when you first open them to sort of be an android phone um, but then they can you can access the alternative platform and as i'm sure many people have seen it's kind of been described as you know being like in an empty room where you can just have frank and honest conversations which is why these phones have been attractive for many um organized organized criminal groups. Importantly, a lot of these devices have what might be called emergency functions. So that might include an auto destruct function where you type in the wrong pin code or a particular pin code and it will force wipe the data. Um, some of them have, if they're not activated in a certain amount of time, they can also, they also have wipe functions. So there's, there's a multitude of ways that these phones are seen to, to guarantee the anonymity of their users. I think what's most helpful, um, Tess, if we could go to the next slide, is to, to think about how, you know, the, this hacking of EncroChat, and that's how I'll kind of broadly define it, um, plays into the, the cases that we're going to we're going to see a rise of and I know Oliver's been instructed on one already and he'll cover that in a bit more detail the main discussion at the moment is what is the law on using this information so I'll start off with in intercepted communication under uh, section 4 of the IPA 2016 the investigatory powers act at first when this kind of this hacking broke out this was where everyone flooded to everyone thought that you know this this is clearly a case of interception and in the uk interception uh, evidence is a bit complicated we're one of the few uh, jurisdictions that don't automatically allow uh, intercepted communication the the interesting thing about the ipa um is that so, so under section four, it covers, you know, intercepted communication, what, what intercepted communication actually means. Um, and if I just I'll read out what it what it says, and it's the person does a relevant act in relation to the system. And the effect of the relevant act is to make any content of the communication available, which seems to have happened in these encro chat cases at a relevant time to a person who is not the sender or intended recipient of the communication. And basically, this relevant act is defined to be either modifying or interfering with the system or its operation, 
monitoring transmissions made by the means of the system or monitoring transmissions made by wireless telegraphy to or from apparatus that is part of the system. Um, and I think Greg will go into a bit more detail as, as to whether or not um, those sort of things might have happened here. As I said, the, the key thing is, is that when it comes to the UK and interception evidence nuanced because we don't automatically allow it. Tess, if we could go to the next slide. So under section 56.1, um, it set out that no evidence may be adduced, question asked, asset, uh, assertion, apologies, assertion or disclosure made or other thing done for the purposes of or in connection with any legal proceedings or inquiries act proceedings, which in any manner, and it says discloses in any circumstances from which its origin and interception related conduct may be inferred any content of an intercepted communication. And that bit's the kind of key bit that the content of an intercepted communication cannot be disclosed in, in proceedings ordinarily or any secondary data obtained from the communication. Um, and, and then it goes on to say uh, that it, what also can't be used is, is that which tends to suggest that any intercepted related conduct has or may have occurred or, may, or is going to occur. But, but, and this is the key thing, there is an exception. And the exception is if the conduct is carried outside of the UK, um, which obviously becomes relevant here because you know, all the news that's kind of broken around the EncroChat hacking is actually that a lot of this took place abroad so the rule prohibiting you know us in the uk relying on this or the, the crown relying i say um it says that you know there, there are two limbs to this that the hack must be carried out by conduct within the uk and the communication must be intercepted by a public or private um telecommunication system so if i just I'm just checking whether I need to go to the next slide. Um, no, not yet. We'll hold on this one for a sec. Um, the, the key, thanks Tess, um, <laughs> you know, remembering your own slides is quite challenging. Um, the, yeah, the, the key thing is that in, in relation to EncroChat is, although the second limb might be met, this, this first one of whether or not it happened in the UK or abroad is kind of where the question is. So if we just go to the next slide now. So there's already some case law on it. Um, Tess, sorry, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, the first case is a case that I'm sure um, many people are aware of. And in this case, it, it did involve uh, the Dutch police or uh, the police in the Netherlands. And in this case, there were recorded telephone uh, communications. And what the Court of Appeal decided is that it didn't breach UK law at the time um, because the interceptions had happened, the intercept evidence had happened in Holland. So the intercept had been gathered in Holland. Um, there were arguments run at the time um, attempting to exclude the evidence, so under Section 78, and, but the court held that, that it wasn't to be excluded either. So this is kind of the big case in this area um, in that when this intercept is carried out abroad, it can be used. But there's another case, um, and that's the case at the bottom, P and others. Um, and in that case, there were, there were also some Article 8 arguments run, or Article 8 and Article 6. And what the, the House of Lords at the time accepted was that the use of an intercept can amount to an interference with Article 8, but because in these circumstances um, the information wasn't held for any longer than it, it was necessary to hold it, there wasn't a breach. So whilst it constituted an interference, it didn't actually constitute a breach. And they also found that there was no breach of Article 6. If you're interested in obviously I would recommend reading those cases um, and I also summarise them in a bit more detail in the article, the first article I wrote on this, um, so there'll be a bit more detail there. Ultimately what it comes down to, if this is going to be considered inter interception evidence, um, is, you know, has it been lawfully done? And that's, that's kind of what the UK courts are going to look at. So even if this interception has been done abroad, has it been done in a lawful way? 
um, and particularly, you know, was this a way to circumvent the UK uh, prohibition on intercept evidence? Or was this, um, as I'll go on to say, was this something that was unified and maybe doesn't fall under interception and actually falls under um, equipment interference? The key thing for defence practitioners to, to consider in these cases is attribution, because whilst these messages have been accessed, thank you Tess, um, whilst these messages have been accessed, attributing these messages to people is, is going to be something that has to be considered very carefully um one of the questions that a lot of a lot of us are asking is will disclosure be sufficient to enable us to properly consider the right re the reliability of this evidence and um, particularly given that it's been conducted covertly um and i think all defense practitioners are going to be thinking about you know can this evidence be excluded if it is a if it is um interception evidence now, the alternative, as I've kind of alluded to so far, if we just turn, please, Tess, um, one second, is in equipment interference. There's been a bit of an update, as many of you may have seen in the news, um, and the suggestion now seems to be that actually it may not be um, intercept evidence for the purposes of the IPA and the, the suggestion is you know perhaps we should actually look at part five of the IPA which is equipment interference um, and again I recommend reading this section really closely because it it is actually quite complicated um, because you have to look at the schedules at the same time as to how you know warrants are applied for and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in just a moment but what seems to be coming out of the news, and this has come out of quite a few news outlets, is that the French uh, National Gendarmerie, then my French accent there was probably poor, I apologise to everyone there, um, put some kind of technical device onto the EncroChat servers. So similar to the way I, I like to think about it, you know, some sort of malware, so a bit like a Trojan horse when people used to get viruses on their, their laptops, but this device is thought to have been put on one of the servers in France. And the, the theory is at the moment that that, that that device enabled them to read the messages before they were sent, but also to record passwords um, and so operated all, all, like a virus, essentially. And that this enabled them to monitor the conversations of thousands of people. Um, it's thought that the the NCA have been, you know, working with the the French police and also the Dutch police in in kind of orchestrating this. And obviously, that's quite different from what we've traditionally thought of as interception evidence. So, under um, Part Five of the IPA, it defines equipment interference, and it's also known as uh, computer network exploitation. So, you might have heard that uh, phrasing as well. And it can be done remotely. It can be done uh, by physically interfering with the equipment. I think some other examples are just, you know, for example, sometimes mobiles, the data from or the information on people's mobile phones can be uh, downloaded by having like a device attached to it. So there's, you know, there's a, there's a real range of how complicated these, these equipment interferences can be. Um, but, but that's the kind of popular theory at the moment. Now, the legality of equipment interference is, is slightly different. And as I said, um, it's worth having a look back at the statute because it can get a bit complicated with um, the warrants. So equipment interference can take place, providing that there is a warrant for it. Um, and the warrants are called but the warrants refer that I that I particularly have been focusing on are you know the targeted equipment interference warrants, um, which you know if if this has been an equipment interference in the way in which some of these theories are suggesting might be what the um, the UK have used here. So the Secretary of State is able. One of the ways in which these warrants can can be granted is the Secretary of State uh, can issue a warrant. Um, and there are a few conditions, and the most relevant here seem to be um, 
well, first of all, the warrant needs to be necessary. And there are a number of ways that that, that can be defined. So it can be in the interest of national security, for example. But most importantly here, I think, is for the purpose of preventing or detecting serious crime. Um, and so, so my view is it probably falls within that. Um, the conduct then needs to be authorised to be proportionate to what is sought to be achieved. Um, there needs to be satisfactory arrangements in place. And then the, the decision to issue the warrant then has to be, well, it has to be, has to have been, apologies, has to have been approved by a judicial commissioner unless it's urgent. Now, that's not the only way. Um, the Secretary of State can also issue these warrants uh, on an application by the Chief of Defence. Um, I don't think that's particularly relevant in these circumstances. What, what might be more relevant is the, that a law enforcement chief can also, one of these, can, can also issue one of these warrants, not just the Secretary of State. Um, and that, the, so again, they look at whether or not the warrant is necessary for the purpose of preventing or det detecting serious crime whether it's authorised and proportionate, and whether there are satisfactory arrangements in place. Again, I provide a lot more detail in that in um, the, the, the second article I, write, I wrote. So please do, if you want, would like a bit more information on that, it, it might provide a helpful guide to, to kind of going back to the statute. The final thing really to say about the equipment interference is that there are of course going to be a lot of concerns about the reliability of this evidence um if some kind of malware has been used the concern is going to be that how how do we know that the evidence hasn't equally been interfered with if someone has the ability to access these servers and and put malware on them how how can we be sure of what's actually being retrieved from these messages um and so that's something that the court are likely to look at. Um, the final part really is that, you know, within all of this, there's there's a suspicion that there's been, or I say suspicion, um, there's definitely been some intelligence sharing across borders. And as I alluded to earlier, the key thing really there is to think about whether or not it was done lawfully in the country where the intelligence was obtained and you know keep an eye on the case law at the moment there is there was a Strasbourg decision Liberty and GCHQ which I'm sure many people have been following um, that's been challenged in a cross appeal and everyone's waiting judgment for that um, and that was about whether article in eight and ten um, have you know have have been breached in these intelligence sharing arrangements so that's a case to really keep an eye on um the the key thing is you know are the did the uk get involved in this to just circumvent our requirements um and that's that's going to be a huge issue i think for any defense practitioner helpful overview of where we're the, the understanding we currently have um of what might have happened um and i'm now going to pass over to oliver who should be there brilliant yeah he is yes i am yes um i hope everyone can hear me um so building on what um alex has just outlined to you uh, we thought it would be helpful if um we could just give you some thoughts um, about how you might approach this from a practitioner's point of view and um, how to um, really help your clients right from the get-go if they are um, arrested in relation to um, matters such as these. I suppose the, the first thing to say, and it may seem like an obvious point, but it's worth making, but it is pretty unlikely that anybody who has been using the Encro chat system is um, only a small bit part player in a criminal organization. You are not going to discover um, runners um, taking drugs to parks or that sort of thing using Encro chat devices. These devices cost, I think, upwards of 1500 quid. And the reality is that they will be used by big fish, big players, 
not uh, little minnows. And um, the Court of Appeal has already said before this story broke that the possession of such devices is uh, an indicator of a higher level of sophistication and uh, an aggravating feature that the court can take into account when it comes to uh, sentence. And um, of course the, the, the position is that um, until this recent uh, breakthrough as described by the NCA, um, one used to just have the devices that were found in somebody's possession. Um, one didn't know what it was that the devices might have been used to, what messages might have been uh, transmitted because of all the features that Alexandra's just outlined to you. But what we've got here really for the first time is akin to intercept evidence, and I say akin to intercept evidence for obvious reasons, we don't know whether that is what has actually happened, and we are slightly in the dark. But the, um, that does have certain consequences for our clients. If integrity is doing the right thing, even when people aren't looking, we, we have in fact exactly the opposite here. What these devices or the uh, evidence is going to show is what criminals do when they think people aren't looking, even though, of course, we now know that people were looking. It's important, though, just to underline that just because somebody's been found in possession of such a device, that doesn't automatically mean they're part of a criminal organization. There are a whole host of people who you can imagine might well want to have encrypted conversations. Politicians, journalists, lawyers, for goodness sake, um, and um, members of the royal family. So there are plenty of people who might wish to have um, encrypted chat. So don't fall for the, uh, the line that because there is such a device, it's automatically an indicator of, uh, of some nefarious activity. But um, looking at our clients who have, by the time Alexandra and I get to um, uh, meet them, have, have of course already been arrested, interviewed, charged, and probably remanded in custody. Um, what's, he, what's your client going to be concerned with? Well, first of all, is there any way that this um, evidence can be excluded? Can we put forward uh, an, an argument to exclude this evidence that isn't then going to impact on the sentence that I might get. And it's worth just uh, bearing in mind that if we're talking about, for example, a conspiracy to import class A drugs on a pretty grand scale, um, people are looking at sentences in double figures beginning with two. And so the credit plea is obviously measured therefore in years so there's that that needs to be thought about with the uh, client and of course many people will not be able to plead guilty because they're simply being told that that's not what we do if you're part of this organization all of these are factors that your clients are going to be uh, concerned about but if we deal with things in a sort of staged and methodical way, then um, hopefully you can get the, the, the best outcome for your client. So admissibility. Alexandra has already talked about that and, and how um, the way in which we have to approach it is going to be um, predicated on the methods of investigation that the NCA and the um, uh, Gendarmerie Nationale and whatever the Dutch authorities uh, are called, uh, how they have uh, approached this. Secondly, the reliability of the uh, evidence that has been obtained. Uh, and thirdly, um, attribution, which is something that you're all very familiar with in any event, because there are plenty of different methods um, so in, in dealing with that three-stage process, there are a number of matters that you want to raise with the prosecution, it seems to us, at an early stage. Um, and that 
if you do that, that will hopefully lay the foundation for any arguments that you may have at a later date. Bear in mind that all three of us are rather um, in the dark at the moment um, as to exactly what has gone on. Um, we can only speculate, and um, so the advice, as it were, that we're giving you here, but it, you'll need to react to the information that, that you are given. And um, just on that subject, the uh, Alexandra has already mentioned that I've been instructed in one such case, and the uh, amount of disclosure that has been received is really very, very scant indeed. And it is also self-contradictory. I have been told on the one hand, and I'll just quote to you what I've been told, evidence has been obtained from a lawfully, lawfully authorized capability that enabled access to gather data from the devices. And I'm end quote there and emphasize from the devices. But later in the same document, um, we have this. Law enforcement have been able evidentially to access and download the content from the EncroChat server. Now, those two are entirely different. It may be both of them happened. We, we simply don't know at the moment. But um, that is the, the, the reason why um, we're having to adopt a bit of a scattergun approach at the moment to, um, to dealing with this because we simply don't know what's gone on. Uh, and I am aware, and it's been raised in fact in an email to the three of us before we kicked off, that there, there is a case in Manchester where they've set down something of a timetable for dealing with preliminary arguments of this nature. And we will have to see whether all encro chat cases await the outcome of that matter and whether we then fly on the coattails of it or try and distinguish the case, we simply don't know. It's, it's too early in all these proceedings. So coming on to, therefore, something of a checklist for you, and um, this will be um, emailed through if any of you want it. Um, and I think um, we are going to have to go back. Back, Act 1. Uh, if you don't mind, thank you. So first of all, question one, what, under what authority was the evidence obtained? Um, Alexandra spoke about warrants, what warrants were issued, where were they issued, what did they authorise, which countries? Did the obtaining of the evidence amount to interception? Did the obtaining of the evidence amount to interference with computer systems? And those are the two questions that go back to that which I you earlier. So over to the, the next slide, please, Tessa. What authority was given for the interception stroke interference? Was the authority blanket or targeted? Well, um, one doesn't know the answer to that at the moment. Were NCA officers sitting around listening to endless um, chats from endless people, possibly including members of the royal family um, and, uh, and journalists, or did they have specific intelligence and were they targeted? And want to consider asking the prosecuting authorities if the um, conduct did happen abroad, as seems uh, almost inevitable from what we know, was that properly authorised in that jurisdiction? Now, I think that is an important uh, question, and it's an important question that most of us as English lawyers are not going to know the answer to. Um, so it would be helpful, you might think, to put out feelers either to Dutch or French lawyers uh, to ask them to Look, we become aware of that is that, that it purports to have been granted to see whether uh, the uh, what has happened has in fact been done in accordance with um, local law and whether um, also going into to what Alexandra said um, the UK authorities have effectively used this as a method of circumventing the inconveniences of um, not being able to use intercept evidence. Next, um, please, Tessa. Is the product of this reliable? Well, the um, 
uh, as I've already mentioned in the case I'm dealing with, that we've had no evidence served at all at this stage. We've got a list of purported chats, but those are, are in a schedule drawn up by a police officer. So one's got no way of testing that at all. Um, and uh, so that then goes into the next question of how are the defence able to test the reliability of that evidence? And the following question, if encrypted and decrypted, how do we know that that process has been dealt with properly in a, in a robust way that allows uh, a jury uh, to be sure and allows us to be able to give um, sensible advice to those that we are representing? And uh, next, please. Attribution. Well, you've already dealt with loads of cases, I'm sure, where attribution is an issue, and that is familiar territory. It's going to involve cell site. It's going to involve looking at provable movements with um, observations, CCTV, ANPR, and, and, and of course the recovery of devices from the hands of individuals or their homes. So that, that's some traditional stuff that, you know, I, I don't want to teach my grandmother or indeed anyone else to suck eggs. You'll, you'll know what you're doing as far as that's concerned. And uh, next slide. As section 78 is going to be absolutely key to whether this evidence is admissible um, if it doesn't fall foul of the um, uh, intercept provisions, if I can put it like that. And then finally there for you on the slide is the, 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 the comments already in those two cases of uh, Nelson and English about um, the possession of such devices being indicative of a higher level of involvement and um, an aggravating feature. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. And now for the bit you've probably all been waiting for, which is the tech you please, Greg. Thanks, Oliver. Um, I hope you can all hear me there. Um, so just uh, to give you a bit of a quick overview, uh, my, ex my expertise is cell site analysis. Uh, however, during recent years, I have actually dealt with quite a few cases involving the devices that we're talking about here. So the, the information I'm going to give out now uh, within the, uh, some slides as well, is based on my knowledge gained working in cases with this kind of evidence really. So I'm not saying it's the oracle of, of uh, and everything you need to know. There may be gaps there. Uh, I don't know everything about this topic, but um, certainly, what I'm going to present here is what I've found from, uh, from real cases. Mm -hmm. So if you move on to the first uh, slide there, please test. Um, so just to uh, clear up uh, or add to what's already been said really, um, there's, there's, there's two aspects of these devices uh, as I see it. EncroChat um, is quite rightly, uh, as described by Alexandra, it's a, it's a, a provider um, who provide this kind of encrypted messaging service uh, on certain devices but also these devices are also known as spoofing phones or you may know the term tumblr phones um, and what we mean by that is they, they are concealing their identity they're masking their true numbers uh, so CLI calling line identity spoofing and, and it's basically disguising the real phone number so two different aspects involved in the devices that we're talking about here. Uh, mo moving on here and uh, onto the type of devices. So when we talk about CLI, CLI spoofing in particular, <clears throat> as I said, it is masking the true identity. Um, the devices have the capability of generating their own numbering uh, each time it's used, uh, chaotic numbering substitution or the user can define what number will appear uh, within the call records. So uh, the police used to call it the, the James Bond SIM because it was set to all the sevens, uh, or uh, some were set to one, two, three, four, five, six, for example, uh, or various other uh, preferred numbers, if you like. So um, that's, and that's what we, we often see within the data. Um, an association with a landline number or a virtual number is often the case as well. 
um, the, the sims have the sims that are provisioned uh, are linked to this other number and uh, again that's something we see quite regularly and we'll go into that a little bit more uh, and the routing of the calls it's it's it, it's almost like reverse billing so the, the the traffic from these devices is often routed abroad onto foreign servers before it comes back to the user who let's say is in the UK for the purpose of, of the exercise so and it, so that will make it look like all activity is incoming to these devices it's another uh, I suppose method of, of making it look as if well uh, the, all of the usage is uh, you're not actively using it for going activity kind of thing so if we moving on the the encryption side now the encryption uh, though those of us who use whatsapp for example um, they tell us that their communications are encrypted um, if we all go back a few years uh, to uh, BBN um, Blackberry messenger networks um, allegedly used by criminal gangs um, some years ago because they used an encryption uh, within their network to so that uh, users can communicate securely with each other over the Blackberry network now we have uh, different uh, applications such as WhatsApp who tell us that they're that the content sent is encrypted end to end so again the devices we're looking at here they will use encryption encryption really is scrambling up the information into a into something that's that looks like complete nonsense and then when it's decoded it will come back to its original state. Uh, so any interception uh, will not show the true content of the message We'll come on to that a bit more shortly you know, in terms of servers and uh, how that works. So yeah, we've talked about um, being hosted abroad. So again, this is, this is pretty much how it could work. Now the virtual numbers that are usually associated uh, are often with a 0203 prefix. So an incoming call to the number is routed via the provider uh, to an IP address which is usually then transferred abroad uh, using foreign servers often Russian um, in, in my experience uh, the call is then transferred to the, to the number via the provider again um, back mm -hmm. in to eventually to the, to the end user and again this is how the reverse billing kind of thing works as well because it will look like all all content is is incoming uh, in using this kind of method. So if we if we move on, the um, Alexandra did talk ab about some of these uh, features. So messages have a burn time, so they they delete themselves after a few minutes. The the, dev the device itself can be remotely wiped. Uh, they call that the kill pill. Um, yes, microphones disabled. One thing uh, that wasn't mentioned there, we, we see a random IMEI number generated each time. Now, uh, for those who may not uh, know, uh, the IMEI is the identity of the handset. So when you or I use our mobile phones in the UK, our networks record our IMEI, which is the handset uh, identity within the call data records. Call data records relating to these devices will often show uh, a different IMEI each time, randomly generated. Uh, voice alteration, uh, yes, uh, again, that's another feature. And the, the powering up can be uh, a regular Android device, but then you use two different buttons and it will start up in secret mode. And that's pretty much how they work. Um, on to the next slide, please. Um, so the providers. Um, so the, what I've seen uh, with these devices is that they are normally um, 
sent into the country with packages of drugs. Um, so you'll get a, a consignment of drugs packaged up and you'll also get the maybe half a dozen EncroChat uh, devices with the SIMs. And generally they are used in uh, organised criminal groups, but as Oliver suggested, usually the higher levels of those groups. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's generally where they will end up. So AY Securities, uh, you may have come across any of those who have worked on any cases involving these devices, you may have seen that name. Now they are a provider. Uh, pretty much, they are a legitimate company, but um, what they're selling uh, is, I think is arguable uh, about whether uh, it's fully legitimate in some respects. The, the Dutch authorities uh, did actually prosecute, I think, uh, EncroChat at, at one point for providing uh, communications for criminal use. Uh, you, you will know more than that about than, than I do. Um, but um, yeah, the Dutch uh, provider EncroChat we've talked about, uh, the handsets generally that I've seen are, are usually BQ Aquarius handsets. And again, there's no phone numbers stored on these. They, 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 they all use short codes or names and you have to be invited to be part of the group, a bit like a group chat you'd have on WhatsApp. Um, and in that way, there, there are no phone numbers ever referred to and stored on, on the phones themselves. Another provider there, uh, Cloud9, that's a third party provider who use SIMs usually provided by someone like AY Securities. So a bit like we have virtual operators, um, Labara or Tesco using one of the four UK networks and Cloud9 are another provider who will also provide that kind of service. So when we do cell site analysis, we have call data records provided to us. And the data that we see that, uh, from the encrypted devices, the EncroChat devices, will be quite immediately obvious that it is this kind of device because you do get, you don't get the same number appearing twice often. Um, so you get the, the different incoming numbers which only appear once. And that's a reverse CLI spoofing. So all the numbers will be just scrambled into uh, randomly generated numbering. There's also the prefixed numbers that I mentioned before. So the user can decide uh, on those numbers and how it looks. As I said, all data looks like it's incoming and all data is described as data. Now, those of you who have done, uh, been involved in cell site analysis know that we get voice calls, we get text messages, but we also get data connectivity within the records. Um, and because all of this traffic is, is uh, routed over the internet um, using servers, it is effectively, it becomes data. So all, all activity looks like it's data. You, you won't see voice calls or text messages. That's how the data will look. Um, so I suppose the crux of all of this really is how do investigators, from a prosecution point of view, how are they going to identify the numbers and then attribute them to a user? So Oliver talked a little bit about attribution. Um, Many of you will be familiar with standard attribution um, because it's normally done by uh, several uh, methods, normally content from the handset itself, but also call data records and cell site analysis. When you start putting it all together, it's a bit of a jigsaw, but law enforcement do that quite well normally, and they end up with a, um, uh, an attribution statement saying, for these reasons, we attribute this mobile phone to, uh, to a certain individual. Now, what I'd say about these devices is that it adds a lot more pieces to the jigsaw to put together. Um, so to, to identify, 
So th these devices will still need to access the UK network. So at some point they will be connecting uh, to, to the UK networks. And there are various methods that the police could use to help identify the, the numbers. So let's say they haven't got a device, they've got a suspect and they, they believe them to be using one of these devices. There's a few different methods they can use then to try and identify the number. And some of these techniques are quite sensitive and they need a, a high level of approval, not Ripper, it's well above that. So we're looking at Chief Constable or Home Office kind of sign off here because it's, it's, uh, it's a different type of inception. It's, it's intrusive with collateral uh, interference as well. So in that respect, it's quite a sensitive technique. But some of you may have heard the terms cell dumps and IMSI grabbers. And these are methods that the police can use to identify a phone number. But at that point, they've still only got a phone number. So they've still got a, a lot of work to do to, to attribute the number. But then at some point, the, the investigations, mm -hmm. when the application goes in for the data for that particular mobile, it may highlight that the, the provider was actually Cloud9. So then it gives you another clue there as to what kind of number this is. And, and then it relies on some reverse engineering often at that point. And then looking back within the data of co-defendants and that number will be identified from their records and will often correlate with the records provided by, for example, Cloud9. So you'll have almost two lots of records that you can align together and, and I help to identify the number that's associated with these devices because they will have usually a UK mobile number associated with them. But identifying that number is key and there are methods of doing it, but it, it's, it's not easy and it's, uh, it does involve quite a lot more police work than a, a standard attribution, but it can be done. And it's been done quite well at times but I would certainly say from a defense point of view you need to be looking at the, the continuity and asking those questions um, and also obviously uh, disclosure um, that's all the, the legal side I suppose which is beyond my uh, understanding in many respects but certainly you need to be looking at the evidential continuity how has that number been identified? Um, was, it a lawful, was it a lawful inception? Um, because some of this is going above and beyond standard procedures. Um, to, to go slightly off uh, piste here, the, the encryption part of, of this um, and the, how the messages have been intercepted um, I can't answer the question necessarily, but obviously it looks as though uh, French law enforcement have been involved in accessing some servers. Uh, how they've done that, I don't know. And how they've, how they've got into the encrypted messages and made sense of them, again, I don't know. But uh, we, we, will, we do have a question on that. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll go on to that uh, following the, uh, the slides. But I think from my point of view that's pretty much covered most of the topic now uh, and before we take some questions um, so I'd like to uh, thank St Andrews Hill to uh, for hosting this um, and the contributions by Alexandra and Oliver found very useful I'm sure you all will um, so in terms of my uh, slides that that's it from me but I am going to be around to take some questions so thanks and I'll, I'll hand back over to um, I believe either Alexandra or Oliver I think it's me Greg thank you very much indeed for that informative um, whistle stop tour around these um, interesting devices um, yes we've had some questions um, which have been sent to me via our own encrypted chat on whatsapp um, and um, they are um, these um, to myself and Alexandra. Um, Britain will soon withdraw from the EU. 
what effect does might that have on um, instruments of mutual recognition um, and uh, the EncroChat investigation? Um, I think the answer to that is in the hands of our political masters, as it were. Um, we are constantly being told by um, the government that uh, national security and criminals and whatnot are right at the top of the government's agenda and they're going to continue to um, cooperate with our friends um, in Europe. I don't immediately foresee that they're going to stop doing that. Um, but in a sense, in these cases that are already underway, the cat is all very, already very much out of the bag. Um, but I imagine that um, part of the Brexit negotiations is going to be very much focused on security cooperation and all this sort of stuff. And I should think that the um, British government will be trying to uh, ensure that cooperation remains um, as it has been, if not better, because as we all know, getting evidence from abroad can be an absolute nightmare. So that would be my answer to that question. Um, thank you very much. There have also been uh, a few questions that have come in about the, the, the case in Manchester that we all read about on um, Crime Line. Um, I'm not involved in that case, so I can't give you the answer. Um, somebody called Karen, and I have, a, I have a stab at what your second name might be, Karen, um, uh, has said that there is a hearing in uh, Liverpool uh, where um, these uh, issues are likely to be ventilated. That's not until October. Um, what effect that has on um, other cases, frankly, remains to be seen. I, I don't imagine that um, anyone is going to want to have um, every single one of these perhaps 700 people that have allegedly been arrested in connection with this, arguing the same points over and over again. Um, but equally, um, there are going to be time limits, uh, custody time limits uh, running. And um, one can't imagine we're all going to want to sit around uh, for months waiting for, um, for a result of a preliminary legal argument. Um, I don't know, uh, I'm afraid, is the, the answer to, to that. Um, there may be some other questions that have come in, so I'll just have a quick look, unless any one of the other panellists has been. Uh, I see that uh, Christopher Fallows has helpfully said that there's a five-day preliminary hearing in the Manchester Crown Court in the first week of November. So um, that is um, a little bit of information about somebody else's case, um, and it perhaps gives us a, a bit of a, a, a timeline. Um, other questions? Let's see if anything else has come in. Um, how do more readily available apps with a focus on encryption, such as Signal app, fit into this? Are they seen in the same light in terms of devices like EncroChat? Um, I've not come across Signal um, myself. Um, I would have thought, though, that any court looking at encryption is going to think that that is a more that is something of an aggravating feature, whether it's on a, a specific sort of Encro chat phone or not. That would have been my view about that. I don't know if you have any information, Greg, about um, Signal app. Um, I don't know specifically that app, but I do know of other apps that that are similar um, that offer encrypted uh, services. The, the, the point being that I think law enforcement in, in the UK, we do have uh, many cases uh, I've worked on have accessed, for example, uh, messages from the, the WhatsApp servers. So um, I guess that must be because they're hosted in the UK and a lawful application has been made to obtain the content. So even though it's encrypted, um, you can still uh, access the, the the full messaging and the full content from the servers, and this this will also answer a question from earlier. Uh, a question was asked about how the the authorities in, uh, got hold of the contents that from the Encro devices uh, from the servers. Now I don't know exactly how. The servers are accessed but the, the question was well could it be from a, a memory buffer prior to encryption but 
my my understanding is end-to-end -end encryption should be just that uh, the encryption should be as soon as you create a message and send it from your device it should be encrypted all the way through until it gets delivered to the recipients now what I, the, the the point here is that law enforcement if they're given authority to access servers then there, there will be a, a way of accessing the the real messaging um, it, 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 with the right technical uh, equipment um, so it's all about getting access to those servers lawfully i suppose is the answer and uh but yet yeah, all, all these other apps that are out there that use a similar kind of uh setup to whatsapp they will all, all have servers which can be looked at and downloaded and content can be can be obtained from them uh, uh assuming the, the correct authorities are in place and especially if they're uk hosted Thank you very much. Just going back to the original question from Simon, um, uh, in terms of it being an aggravating feature. Uh, the aggravating feature of having encrypted chat is that the police um, or law enforcement can't access it. Now, I don't think anybody would suggest that having WhatsApp on your phone, which is an encrypted uh, chat, is an aggravating feature. Um, the, the, the point is, is the uh, chat um, or the app uh, designed to frustrate uh, law enforcement? Um, and I think if the answer to that is yes, then um, it's potentially going to be viewed as an aggravating feature by a sentencing court. It'd be a question of evidence, I think. Well, I think that is, unless any other questions are going to ping up. Um, no, they haven't. Um, that, that answers the questions that are being asked. So um, thank you very much indeed for joining us, um, over 100 of you. It's um, an extraordinary. We will now let you go off into the sunshine or um, uh, perhaps get back to, to doing some, uh, some billable work. But um, thank you once again to the LCCSA. Thank you ever so much to uh, Greg Robinson from uh, Footprint. Um, who has provided us really with his invaluable experience. But those of us who are in our everyday lives, complete Luddites, have learned an awful lot about how these devices work. And um, uh, thank you all for, for joining us.